start with a month of knowledge, a month of spiritual understanding. And the reason is because God wants to begin to bring us into definite spiritual realities and definite spiritual experiences. For you to get to a point where things don't just happen to you, but you make things happen, you will have to be able at, by all means, handle setting spiritual knowledge. It takes knowledge to be in command. People who make things happen, they don't stumble on things. There is a definite body of knowledge they are in custody of that confers upon them the authority to make things happen. And so, your experiences in life are a direct reflection of your understanding. The moment your understanding begins to change, your experiences begin to change. There is no devil anywhere that can stop your manifestation if you have requisite understanding. The reason the devil appears very strong is because our ignorance empowers him. The moment our ignorance is removed, the helplessness of the devil is made manifest. And so there is no demon anywhere that can determine the outcome of your life if you have the right understanding. And so in this month, it has pleased the Father to bring us into definite body of truth, body of knowledge that will confer upon us the power of dominion. Because it's a month of knowledge, what God will be doing tonight will be happening on the strength of your revelation. You see, when you come for a service like this, a miracle service like this, two things are imperative. Number one, it's important for you to know that what God will do will be beyond bodily healings. In fact, sometimes many persons may not even be healed because their problem is not bodily. Most times, the reason we take bodily healings, which we also have tonight, is because it's part of the areas that God always impacts as he touches men. But there are four cardinal aspects of every man that God impacts. Number one is a spirit. Number two is a soul. Number three is his body. And number four are his circumstances. There are two ways God impacts your spirit. The first way God impacts your spirit is to bring life into your spirit. Because without Jesus, you are dead. And so when you make contact with God, what he does is that he introduces the economy of life into your spirit. And that's what we call the born again experience. But after you are born again, something else happens to your spirit. It's what we call transfiguration or glorification. And so every time you come into God's presence, your spirit glows. As you make contact with God, you, you just go aglow in the spirit. The light of your spirit, the illumination, the glory that you carry, the measure of the glory you carry increases. And so when you come for a service like this, what happens to you is that your your, the glory, the measure of glory you carry begins to increase. And so that's an aspect of the spirit. And so if you are not bodily sick, your spirit will also receive an impartation. Now that glory that comes upon your life begins to give you authority as you walk through life. Because glory is a force in the spirit. This is why the more glorified a man is, the more dominion he commands. Even Jesus, our Lord, before he rose from the dead and the measure of glory he carried increased, Jesus was limited by physical factors. But after he was glorified, there was no limitation. In fact, he could just walk through the wall and say, peace be with you. The wall was no longer a barrier. 
So glorification confers authority for dominion to a man. And so you may come for a service like this, all that will happen to you will be glorification. Your spirit comes aglow, higher realms of glory. And when you walk out of the service, what you discover is dominion, exercise of dominion in different spheres of your life. You may not even attribute it to what happened in the service, but the truth is that glory increased on your life. And that's why circumstances will begin to respond to it. The second thing that happens to you is an impartation on your soul. And what happens to the soul are many. But just because of our time, maybe I talk about two quickly. The first thing that happens to your soul is transformation. Because everything you become is a record on your soul. Sin is a record. It's a writing on your soul. Fear is a record on your soul. Everything that forms your personality is a document that your soul keeps. And so when you come into God's presence like this, one of the many things that happen to your soul is that light comes to your soul and the record of death is deleted. And so you'll discover that the inefficacies and the deficiencies of the soul that limited your experience in life, your quality or qualitative experience in life, they begin to be withdrawn because those records are deleted. Fear begins to go, iniquity begins to go, and many things that reduces the potency of your soul power are deleted. And so you become a better person. Another thing that happens to your soul is healing. The soul can also be sick. You know, in Luke chapter 4, are you playing something at all? No, don't play according to the volume of your earpiece. Play according to the external volume. Let me hear what you are playing. He is ascending and I'm not... <laughs> can you imagine? I'm trying to find some reading. I can't get any reading. <laughs> Give me some sound. I need to feel light. You don't know that what I want to share is in the spirit. <laughs> if I don't get those inspirations, I'll be dwarfed. Meanwhile, my powers are in heaven. And he wants to keep me on earth with white suit. <laughs> and then when I'm dwarfed, I'll be struggling here. Those who don't understand the, the technology will be wondering. Give me height in the spirit. Give me stature. <laughs> and so there will be healing for your soul. Because the soul can also be diseased. In Luke chapter 4 from verse 18, when Jesus was speaking, the moment the Holy Ghost came upon him, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he began to address some of the sicknesses that the soul suffers from. There are many persons that are in captivity. There are many persons that, persons that are bruised. There are many persons that are depressed. There are many persons that are weak. They can't find the energy to fulfill destiny. They know what they should do, but they are tired. They know they should read, they can't read. They know they should wake up and go out and walk, but the momentum is not there. It's a sickness in the soul. So, Zion will not be able to bring forth because the soul is sick. And so, when you come for a service like this, sometimes the, the rays of light are channeled to your soul, like radiation. And they begin to pull off every sickness that is in your soul. You will discover your approach towards life will change drastically. A brother came to me a few months ago. He's looking at me, so I won't call his name and nobody knows him. And we finished praying and I shook him. I said, God wants to bring you into wealth. He didn't understand what happened. He said, Amen, and left. After a few weeks, millions began to come. He was shocked. Millions began to come. Ah, uh -uh. In a few months, he discovered the digits in his account had increased very rapidly. More than six digits. You know, when you enter seven digits, you can begin to rest financially. He entered some heavy digits. He now discovered that the prayer was a body. He stopped. You know, he, it's enlightenment. Something is happening to your soul. As your soul is gaining strength, it's affecting your environment. He now stopped 
when we met six months later the money vanished he now came and told me he said i will serve god with all my life forever and ever things don't happen from the external what you see in the external are realities in the internal because it is the internal that is connected to heaven if the internal is affected it will manifest in the external and so many times god will heal your soul so that your soul can retain light and function from the realm of light so a miracle service is not primarily for the body and then there are times where god will deal with your circumstances directly the testimony they shared earlier the sister applied for for canadian visa when she came here it was about six months no eight months already and she began to pray she began to build capacity she began to pray she began to build capacity nothing happened about the visa for three months but what she discovered was that she started hearing the voice of god she heard the voice of god to a precision that the lord told her the night before pray against that and she received an impression about her husband but she was wondering is he her husband or her sister so she went home and relaxed the next morning the lord put pressure on her pray against death so she just prayed against the spirit of death one hour later the husband would call her that he just escaped a ghastly motor accident so the first thing god did was to re reconstruct her soul and when her soul was reconstructed it was on the plane of that reconstruction that the visa came because she came to church the, i think that was the first week of november so it's this thing is is something that happened in a few days one year had passed and i was declaring from here i said the doors of nations are open and i said that canada door has opened she didn't even hear the children heard it so her spirit didn't catch what was prophesied she now went to the office the next day and god told her that visa will come this week now you know there's no way that can be guesswork because it has been on one year had passed there's no way you can reduce the scope into one week so she wrote it down gave her husband the paper this is what god said and the husband kept it two days later the visa now came she now discovered the visa was not the testimony the testimony was that she had gained ascension into light she could hear the voice of god now so she's not going to canada now to succeed she's now going to canada as an ambassador of heaven so services like this hold greater potentials than just healing healings take place but much more than healings happen glorification of your spirit man takes place transformation and healing of the soul takes place circumstantial turnaround take place and so some of the testimonies continue for many weeks and for many months and so the first thing you need to learn from a miracle service is that the healing or the miracle is beyond what happens to your body the second thing you need to learn from a miracle service is the fact that I want your spirit to be open is the fact that the challenge is not a problem it cost it will cost God nothing to address your challenge in a moment the challenge was never the problem the problem was your inability to access help that is already available if you study the subject of faith technically you will discover nothing we do moves God God has already moved that's how God operates before God created the man everything the man would need was already provided it was in the evening of the last day that he created the man so the man came into abundance the oxygen that over 7.9 billion people are depending on now the same volume of oxygen was already available for two people in the garden of Eden To give you an idea the abundance that god provides for men god has not come to create more oxygen the volume of oxygen that is enough for almost eight billion people 
was what God made available for two people in the garden. And that's how God operates. He brings you into abundance. So if you are not accessing it, the problem is not with God. The problem is your inability to access. And so in a miracle service like this, what you try to do is to find the channel through which God is using to reach you. The moment you get that channel, you will take your answer and it will be so cheap that sometimes you may need to tell yourself, it's God that walked to. This is not coincidence. Do you know everybody going to hell is forgiven? Are you aware? That nobody going to hell, God is not angry with anybody going to hell. Everybody going to hell is forgiven. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, hear what he said. He said, if any man sin, he said, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the propitiation for sin. That means Jesus is the price for sin. And Jesus has already been paid. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The propitiation is for all men and it has been paid. The grace of God that saves has appeared to all men. In fact, in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So Jesus was enough payment for the sins of the whole world and for the sins of all men. The people going to hell are going to hell because they can't receive forgiveness. God has already made forgiveness available to everybody. But only those who are able to receive it, receive salvation, will not go there. So any man going to hell, forgiveness was available to him, but he went there because he didn't receive it. And any man not going to hell, is not going to hell not because of anything he did. He's not going to hell because he was able to, uh, to receive the forgiveness that was available for all men. Because if God censored men, we came 2,000 years after Jesus died. But forgiveness was still available to us. So we are forgiven today because we are able to receive. Those who went to hell the day Jesus was crucified went to hell because they didn't receive it. Those who will go to hell on the last day of this world will go to hell because they, don't, they, didn't receive, they won't receive it. So inability to receive therefore becomes a big problem for humankind. So the greatest challenge of a man is not the problem he's going through. The greatest challenge of a man is his inability to receive the help that is already available. And so in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, he says, according as his divine power, he has given to us all things that pertains to life and to godliness. He says, but it is through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. That means the moment you receive knowledge, you will be able to receive all things that pertain to life and godliness. What he also means is that all things that pertain to life and godliness is already available. But your inability to access it is because you have not come into knowledge. And so the reason God is leading us to study the subject of knowledge in this month is not to become proud that we know so much. Rather, is to help us enter into many freedoms and many liberties. Because the proof that you know it's not mental inclinations. The proof that you know is that you are made free. So what God wants to do is to bring us into many liberties that are already available that we are not accessing because of our lack of knowledge. In fact, when I was teaching last week, in order to help us understand the kind of knowledge I was talking about, I said there were four kinds of knowledge. I said the first kind of knowledge is gnosis, it's mental knowledge. Your ability to argue with facts. But life and destiny is bigger than facts. I was sharing with them in summit on Sunday. Was it Sunday now? Or maybe Saturday. I was there Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So I can't remember which. And I told them, the biologist believes that the cell is the unit of life. So he reduces everything about life to a strand of DNA, the cell structure. And I told them that God speaking from his own realm. He said, before you were formed, I knew you. That means life is deeper than a cell. 
This is why you can't judge your life only by fact. They are accepting knowledge that are deeper than facts. But if you are operating from the realm of gnosis, you will only function with facts and information. And you will be grossly limited. So I say when you migrate from fact, you come to the second level of knowledge, which is idol. Idol means to become aware. And the first thing that awareness will do for you is to know, help you know what God has made available. That science is here to discover. Because there are some things God has made available that science, on account of God's mercy, are able to find and have discovered. But there are many other things God has made available that science has not yet discovered. So when you come into idol, you become aware. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, the Bible said, We have not received the spirit that is of this world. It said we have received the spirit that is of God, that we may freely know the things, that we may be able to know the things that are freely given to us by God. So there are many things given to us by God that we cannot know until we become aware. And then I said, when you migrate from idol, you come to epignosis. And I said, epignosis is a knowledge that is, beyond, is superior to just being aware. Epignosis is participatory knowledge. It's a knowledge where you are invited to commune. So you don't just, you are not just aware, but now you can participate. In 1 John chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 2, it said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. So once upon a time, it was a story from the beginning. Once upon a time, it was something you were aware of. But the point came, you now handled it. That level of knowledge where you can tangibly say you have touched it is what we call epignosis. Many people are not there. And then I said the fourth level of knowledge is Ginosko. Ginosko is participatory knowledge that produces results. Because it's possible for you to experience and not have results. Hope you know it's not every intimacy that produces a child. There are many intimacies that are highly experiential but barren in their nature. And so when experience is able to produce a child, it becomes Ginosko. And so when God is talking about knowledge, he's not just talking about mental ability. In fact, when you have mental knowledge, you can be proud. But when you have experiential knowledge, it humbles you. Because you know it is the product that validates it. Not the talking it or expressing it. Are we together? And so in this service tonight, God wants to touch our circumstances from spirit to soul, to body, and to every other thing surrounding us. But he wants to do it through knowledge and understanding. This is a month of knowledge. And so it's important for you to understand what I want to share. Because God will not just act, address the problem you are going through. God will also empower you to begin to address that problem in the life of others. That's where the excellency of knowledge comes in. If I come here and God tells me, he wants to touch people by the anointing. All I need to do is to charge my spirit. When my spirit is charged, the anointing flows, it touches people. They will be blessed, they will go, but they will not know how to replicate it. But when God touches people through knowledge, they are not just impacted, but when they leave, they will be able to do the same thing and become a help to another person. And so when God is blessing people through knowledge, he is also equipping them at the same time. Are we together? And so tonight's miracle service, God will be reaching us through spiritual understanding. And so the subject God wants me to consider is what I've titled by the Holy Spirit, the mystery of spoken words. And so everybody here who talks should benefit from this truth if understood the mystery of spoken words words are some of the most mystical and mysterious things that God has made available to humankind but because light has not been shared on this subject many people trivialize words in fact those who take words seriously they use words for communication. And that is very beautiful. So they have speech power. They are eloquent. 
they have mastery of all the literary requirements for excellent communication and that's beautiful in fact you can study that to phd level that's wonderful it will make you an expert in communication today many companies of the world and many institutions have what they call public relations officer because of the prime position of 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 public image and so those who have the ability to communicate those who have that skill they are usually sought after hired and paid heavily to communicate on behalf of companies so words are important at that level in that they are used for communication and then there are other people who don't value words at all they just say anything and go away when you hold them to their words they look at you and say sorry they think sorry is a remedy for everything meanwhile sorry changes nothing if done genuinely it's a sign that you will not do it again but it doesn't repair what it has destroyed and if not done genuinely like our politicians use it if they do at all it's an attempt to escape from responsibility so many people use sorry in order not to take responsibility for their inefficacies so he destroys something, something and he says sorry well I've heard your sorry but what do we do about this thing you have damaged because money is involved integrity is involved but many people don't know the value of words they just misbehave and they throw sorry at you as if sorry will solve the problem sorry is a sign that you are remorseful and if you are reasonable you have repented but if you are unreasonable you are refusing to take responsibility whether for the reasonable or the unreasonable it doesn't solve the problem and so spoken words are very important in that they have consequences in fact words are so important that one of the areas men will be judged on the last day is in the area of the things they said in matthew chapter 12 verse 36 jesus was speaking and he said to them he said every idle word not some every idle word a man speaks he said he will account for it on the last day that's how important words are to god and secondly spoken words are so important to god that the whole economy of salvation is routed through speaking god became man god identified with the sin of man god died the death of a criminal made salvation available and the only way god wants you to receive salvation is to believe and to confess to show you how important words are in the realm of god in romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 he said if you believe in your heart the lord jesus you shall be saved he said if you if you confess with your mouth rather you shall be saved he said with the heart man believeth unto righteousness he said but with the mouth man is saved salvation is prosecuted so wars are so important that it is a basis for eternal judgment and wars are also a basis for salvation so every man you see who is saved today is saved because he used wars to affirm that what god did was for him so the reason people will go to hell is because they didn't believe in jesus and they didn't confess it that's how powerful wars are the same wars we throw around carelessly and so it's important for us to understand the mystery of words so we we'll begin to use words in order to get ahead in life because many times the level of progress you will enjoy in life will be a product of all you have taught and all you have said what people don't understand is their present experience is a report card of the summation of the things they've said for a period of time a man who is in the pit is in the pit today because he said it a man who is defeated is defeated because he said it he may not realize it that wars are that powerful but wars are vehicles that transport you to experience if you handle them carelessly the outcome of your life will show it that you wrecked your life by what you said and so wars are some of the most important 
things or assets that men possess. That's why the Bible said, carry with you wars. Carry them. Everywhere you are going, carry wars as weapons. If you want to go into a business, carry wars. If you want to go into a family, carry wars. If you want to go into ministry, carry wars. You may lack everything, but by all means, don't lack wars. They say, how forceful are words spoken in season the potency and the effectiveness of a man's life is tied to his speakings trust me failures failed from their talking nobody just failed by accident everybody who failed failed by prophesying his way into failure and so tonight i want to explain to us few mysteries of spoken words and I also want to explain to us how to take advantage of spoken words and then I also want to explain to us how to receive spoken words if these three things are put in place your life will begin to change from this instance you know one of the testimonies they shared here was in Boko two days ago I, I just spoke to them casually I was interested in doing discipleship actually but they were all eager for healing because the person who invited me called it a healing service so when I spoke for about one hour 40 minutes and I discovered they were not interested in what I was saying I now closed my Bible and said since you people are not interested in my message let's just pray and go and I stood I said in the name of Jesus be healed I said growth dematerialize and to my dismay a lady shows up who had a very big lump on her leg that just vanished as though the walls became radiation I was ministering here in the last miracle service and I said there's somebody here with an enlarged scrotum going through excruciating pain I didn't even know the guy came out because we were late I said we won't take testimonies only for the guy to insist on writing in his testimony that he escorted somebody for the service he didn't come he had no expectation he escorted somebody but the word picked him out too forensically that he couldn't escape the outcome and a large scrotum went down pain vanished just by talking and so when you know that words are that powerful you will become careful what you say and how you say what you say because these are two very vital things principles in dealing with words what you say and how you say what you say what you say is important and how you say it is also important and so if you want to operate in dominion by spoken words you must become a master of what to say and how to say it but before we delve into that let's look at five or six mysteries of spoken words this will first of all reveal to somebody why he is where he is because you think what you need is a drum of oil poured on you they can pour two drums of oil on you you can erase it by talking you can go and live with a, a prophet in his house for three months but you will use your words to kill yourself so it's important to understand this there are six things i want to talk about here and they are the mysteries biblical mysteries of spoken words the first mystery of spoken words is that spoken words transfer and transmit spirits if you want to find out how spirits travel they don't travel in cars spirits don't travel with planes spirits travel when words are spoken and so men must understand that every word they speak mobilizes spirits your words are spiritual locomotive agencies for spirits and so a man will not have the activity of spirits around him unless he speaks and so if you want to see the spirit of god at work in your life then you need to know how to talk the spirit of god to work if you want to see demons at work in your life which nobody wants but that's what they do is to talk things that transport demonic spirits because whether you like it or not so long as you begin to speak spirit begins to travel in Ezekiel chapter 2 verse, verse 1 and 2 the prophet stood before the glory of God he saw the brightness 
he saw the excellency he saw the splendor in fact he saw the cherubims the excellency of what he saw was so much that he fainted but with all of the activities that were happening the spirit of god didn't move so you can come under a very intense atmosphere the spirit will not move you can see the glory of god and faint under the power the spirit didn't move the man was on the floor as a dead man after having seen the glory of god and suddenly he said in verse one he said and he said unto me son of man stand upon thy feet and i will speak unto thee and the next thing we heard was he said and the spirit entered into me when he spake unto me the moment words are spoken spirits travel what i'm saying here spirits are moving you may not feel it after two hours or an hour plus you will suddenly notice that the energy will change because the activity of spirits will become intense as you keep speaking they keep moving as you keep speaking they keep moving in fact if you study john chapter 11 when jesus was invited to lazarus's tomb lazarus was tied bound and kept in the tomb and jesus was there nothing happened jesus wept nothing happened imagine god crying after god cried nothing happened and that weeping was not a joke he wept bitterly nothing happened so you can cry over your situation as much as you want nothing will happen even if god joins you in crying nothing will happen <laughs> because god joined matter and cried nothing happened but when the spirit of life was to be mobilized jesus showed up and said lazarus come forth immediately spirits moved and the man was carried from where he was kept and he stood at the door so what mobilizes spirits are words so the words we speak every day is mobilizations for spirits in john 6 63 he said it is the spirit that quickens he said the flesh profited nothing but how do you activate the quickening spirit he said the way to activate this quickening spirit is by talking because the quickening spirit can be there but he will not quicken so he said the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life so the way i mobilize the quickening spirit is by talking but you talk from morning to night and you are not conscious that spirit moved that's why you have not tapped into the mystery of spoken words you think spoken words are for communication and so you talk for a whole week all you are doing is communication a man who has entered the reality of the mystery of spoken words he knows his words are a gift that's why sometimes he will look at you he will not say anything you can talk 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 he will just not he knows if he talks to you you are blessed you will think he's pride but he knows he knows something have you not seen somebody shared a testimony he took a huge sum of money a huge sum of money to go and see one of the fathers of faith he came in from another country he waited from morning to evening only for them to tell him sorry you can't see god's servant today and the truth is god's servant was busy because since he came and sat outside god's servant was in the office and so when they were closing the office and asked everybody to leave and come tomorrow he had to return to his country frustrated he was just walking away and to his dismay not up to five minutes god's servant was driving past and he went down my son the guy told what is the challenge he knelt down and said i came from sierra leone my ministry i've been struggling nothing is working i make flyers every week nobody comes I do publicity and radio jingle. Nobody comes. I go live on the internet. Nobody's watching. And after putting all the labor of fasting and prayer, I come to church, talk to myself and my wife. I'm tired. And God's servant looked at him. Go forward. That's all. <laughs> go forward. That's all. The man returned to his country 
the next Sunday. In fact, he came back Saturday night, so there was no time for mobilization. And when he entered church on Sunday, as, morning, as opening prayer was going on, all the seats in front were filled. He now knelt down and began to, to ask God to help him. He has been shouting there since, but a man who has a mystery spoke. Without flyers, without radio jingle, how did the people come? What brought them? What was the what what happened there? What brought them when he said go forward? All the spirits that are responsible for publicity went to work. That's when he discovered the remobilization. It's not flyers that do it, they are angels. Go forward, and without mobilization, all packed, and that's how ministry began to move from glory to glory. I had another story of WF Kumuye. They brought a madman bound in chains. And when he strode out, he looked at the people. The madman was all over the place. He said, leave him. So the pastors thought, they, he was talking to them. They now said, he is violent. If we leave him, he just smiled. When the pastors saw that he smiled, they now left him. When they left him, they discovered the demons already heard and left. So... When they say leave him, the demons obeyed first before the pastors came into understanding. But how do these people become so powerful? They know the power of war, so they don't throw their walls around. They know when they speak, things happen. When they speak, people are blessed. When they speak, spirits obey. Because it is a mystery in the spirit. Men who struggle, they don't know that walls mobilize spirits. That's why they talk anyhow. The moment you come into this understanding, your words become few. Because you know your words mobilize spirit. And you want to be careful the spirit you are mobilizing. That's the first mystery of spoken words. There are persons that have mobilized spirits against their own progress. By the things they said. Nothing is working. And the spirit that is responsible for making things not to work. Say thank you for the permission. I will go to work now. And the spirit goes to full time job and nothing ever works and they don't know what is going on it doesn't matter whether you know it or not this is a reality in the spirit number two wars transmit life and death i showed you already in john 6 63 he said the wars i speak they are not communicative emphasis or realities he said they are spirit and they are life that means when you want to increase the quality of your life or the life of somebody speak it so life is encapsulated in words so also is death encapsulated and so if they ask you where does life dwell life dwells in words that's why in john chapter one it said that word was made flesh no he said in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god he said the same was with god in the beginning all things were made by him without him was not anything made that was made he said in him in the word he said was life that means the capsule of life is words so also the capsule of death is words so every time men speak they either release death or they release life in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21, the Bible made a very striking statement. It said life and death are in the, not in the tongue. They are in the power of the tongue. The power of the tongue is spoken words. And so a man can choose to eat life. He can choose to eat death. So every time you speak life, you are actually feeding on life. And every time you speak death, you are actually speaking on death. So the second mystery of spoken words is the fact that life and death are encapsulated in words. It's only men that think words are for communication. Spirits know better. You can kill yourself by talking. You can kill your child by talking. You can kill the economy by talking. 
And so when men begin to understand the secret of power, power by words, they become careful what they say. Because when they speak, they speak death. Or they speak life. It's their choice. In Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, hear what happened here. He said, when the evening was come, he said, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast the spirit out with his words and healed them so you see that he applied these two principles here number one he mobilized the demons out of the people by speaking and number two he injected healing and life into the people by speaking and so jesus knew that when he spoke he communicated to spirits to mobilize them and when he did he also injected life into them that's why you'll find a man who is spirit truly spiritual never says idle things everything he says is consequential in the spirit because he knows like he knows his name that every spoken word conveys spirit or they convey life number three wars create and wars also destroy creation is at the mercy of spoken words in Genesis chapter 1 you know most of you know these scriptures but you've not been taught these truths so you've never really applied them that's why I said whom shall he teach knowledge whom shall he make to come into understanding he say him that is weaned from the breast and from the milk. He say for precept shall be upon precept. He say lines shall be upon lines. A lead to here, a lead to there. So spiritual truth has scattered. It takes the spirit of revelation to help you correlate them. That's when it becomes profitable to you. Most of you know all these scriptures I'm quoting. But you've never applied them constructively to make progress in life. Words create. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? And the earth was void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the waters. Nothing happened. The spirit of God moved. Nothing happened. Have you seen why people fall under the power sometimes? Nothing happened. The spirit of God moved. The world was still in darkness. Until he said let there be light the moment the spoken words came suddenly creation began and that's why john chapter 1 from verse 1 to 4 said the word was the creator of all things and so when you are speaking you are creating when you are speaking you can also be destroying let me show you how you destroy by speaking ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 and verse 29 see what the bible says it said giving no place to the devil he now went further in verse 29 to show you how you give place to the devil he said let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearer that means when you speak corruption you are giving place to the devil and when you give place to the devil, John chapter 10 verse 10, he said, the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So a man who is speaking can either be creating or destroying. He creates by speaking it into being and he destroys by giving allowance to the destroyer called the devil to come in through filthy and corrupt communication. Most of you are not aware the things you've said with your mouth they've impacted your life more than every other thing in your lifetime either positively or negatively because words they create and they destroy the fourth thing words do is that they build and purify or they defy so your words can build you up it can build others up. You saw that already in Ephesians 4.29. 
He said that it may be to the edifying of the hearer. That means when men hear spoken words, they have the capacity to build them up. The best way to build yourself up is with words. Not just with fried rice and chicken. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. He said, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. So words build up. And words can also destroy. In John 15 verse 3. And 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 to 4. You are going to see these two operations there. In 1 Corinthians 14 verse 3 to 4. The Bible makes us understand that him who speaks spirit energized words or prophesies he says he edifies the whole church so one man can edify the church the way i'm edifying you now just by talking and he said him that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself so so long as words are being spoken edification takes place and in john 15 verse 3 jesus was speaking he said you are clean because of the words you have heard so the way you take a spiritual bath is by speaking the word of god you bathe physically by pouring water and using detergent if you want to bathe spiritually you will use the word of god so most of the people who are dirty carrying garments of reproach carrying garments of shame carrying garments of rejection they are carrying all of those things because they've not had a spiritual bath and so jesus said if you want to bathe in the spirit he says speak words he said you are clean because of the words i've spoken to you do you know what spiritual field is spiritual field is sin is reproach is rejection is bad luck all of those things they stain you in the spirit and so if you want to cleanse yourself the way you cleanse yourself is by speaking the right words as you are speaking it over yourself over and over the words will wash you because words edify and they clean many persons are dirty in the spirit they went to the internet and stains were rubbed on them they heard some things from their friends that are smokers their friends that are immoral and they stain their spirit you need a bath and the way to do that is to speak words or to have words spoken over you to cleanse you and as you are cleansed, you will discover that you are built up. And when you are built up, you become an overcomer. And the same way, words can defy. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, hear what the Bible says. So the way you become spiritually dirty is also by hearing the wrong words. You don't become spiritually dirty by playing in the mud. You become spiritually dirty by allowing evil communication rub off on you. He said, but be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. So wars either edify and cleanse or wars can break down or defile. These are mysteries. This is why we walk through life and we cannot understand why our life is full of chaos, ups and downs. These are the reasons. We either spoke demonic spirits or we spoke death or we spoke defiance. And so because of all of these weights we carry, our life cannot be coherent. But the Bible said the part of the just man is as a shining light. It says it shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. That means the part of a just man should be upward and forward only. Our life is not up and down. The people of the world are those who have up and down. Somebody was giving an illustration. And he said, even if you put the... Uh, that equipment you use to, to read life, what do you call it? Doctor, cheat. Stethoscope, that's the one they put on the ear. There's one machine. See, ECG monitor. It's even the ECG monitor. When you are monitoring life, it's up and down. So life is up and down. That is natural life. The life of a spiritual man is from glory to glory. It's upward and forward only. If they check the graph of your spiritual life, it should go this way until you get into heaven. But if it's not going like this, your walls is what is making it zigzag. Are you learning something? I told you what God will do for you tonight will come to you by revelation. 
you will discover your problem is not what you have been calling your problem that mountain can become a mole if you know the right thing and do it you will be so shocked how god can lift you suddenly from the pit and only him will take the glory for it number four number five words transmit authority positions when a man wants to communicate or transfer the influence of his authority the way he does it is through words if you study Luke chapter 1 from verse 17 to 19 20 actually when the, the angel Gabriel came to Zacharias and told him your wife Elizabeth shall be with child and he shall be a prophet he outlined all that he would do and Zacharias looked at him and said how shall these things be ah. and Ezekiel uh, Gabriel told him he said I am Gabriel I stand in the presence of God I have brought you these glad tidings and you doubt me he said because of this you will be dumb until the day that these things happen so the way Gabriel transferred the impact of his authority was by speaking so when a man speaks his words communicate his authority a man in authority cannot impart his authority except as he starts talking that's how he works and you I taught you already last week that you are a new creation that you are of the order of the second Adam that means you are a being of authority but the way you can communicate your authority and communicate it effectively is by talking else you will be a new creation that is molested you will be a new creation that is defeated you will be a new creation that is dying so if you want to exercise the, your, your authority as a new creation the way you do it is by speaking words so your words will reflect your authority every day every time have you seen a rich man talk before he talks from the standpoint of his authority you tell him there's a challenge you say what is it you say sorry this thing is a big thing what is it speak up you are saying sir please oh, don't be offended um, speak up what's the problem the poor man will never talk sir please I'm dying please help me he wants to to, to, to culture sympathy and compassion the wealthy man doesn't have that time talk we change things by talking if you are not talking you can't be helped and when you talk he says is that all it is done he has not given you money but he said it is done because he's conscious of his authority if you know you are a being of authority it will influence in the way you talk when things are going wrong you say no not around me i command it to change i decree by the holy spirit in the name of jesus it changes and you go and sleep not this one that you say it changes and you you lie down you are doing like this has it changed how far is anything how? relax relax there is nothing else you can do after you have spoken because the way to transfer your authority is by talking and that you have already done so the way men of authority communicate their authority is by speaking somebody will need to live here again and be taught how to speak it's a serious matter in spiritual journey i'm telling you how to speak is one of the most important spiritual lessons you will learn because if you don't know how to speak you may have everything but you will still suffer as if nothing is working that's why i said when men are cast down they say you say there's a lifting up because your success your breakthrough and your deliverance is at the mercy of what you say and as i go further you will see it he said let no one in zion say i'm sick so god god is conscious about teaching people how to talk because it's one of the greatest force that will impact their lives either positively or negatively all we are trusting god for in this miracle service is at the mercy of, of what i will say by the time we finish the praise finish the worship share the word is that moment where we say in the name of jesus that's where things begin to happen because authority is communicated through words did you not read what jesus said in mark 16 17 
He said, in my name, cast out devils. You show up, the devil will look at you. Until you say, out. He won't go. Because he doesn't know what you want. So authority is transferred through speaking. So every day you talk, you are actually disseminating authority. Either in the positive or in the negative. Unfortunately, many persons disseminate and dissipate authority in the negative. We are so educated about these things in the natural, but in the supernatural, we are not. Somebody who is a, a, a chairman of a company, he doesn't come into the office and talk carelessly. No. His words are calculated. He gives only instructions. He gives instructions. We have some senior people here, bank managers. We even have some military officers here, some are majors. They know how these things work. They give command. They give instruction. But when they come into the spiritual context, they become weak. And this is why many are defeated in life. Because they don't know authority is communicated by speaking. Last one I give you now quickly before we proceed is that you are either justified or condemned by what you say. Isaiah 43 verse 26. He said, put me in remembrance of my word. That's God talking. He said, remind me, else I won't do. Put me in remembrance of my words. He said, by thy words. He said, thou mayest be justified, and by thy words, thou mayest be condemned. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, from around where we just read, the Bible said, a man is justified by his words, and he said, a man is condemned by his words. So the courts of heaven is waiting for you to speak, for them to enact verdict. It is what you say that determine, determines what to be done for and to you. So spoken words are very mystical realities in the spirit. They are very mystical because they mobilize spirits, they are very mystical because they mobilize life or death. They are very mystical because they create or destroy. They are very mystical because they build and purify or they defy. They are very mystical because they transmit authority. And they are very mystical because they are the basis for justification and condemnation in the spirit. This is why words are very significant and important realities in the spirit but you see we are learning this some of us very late not late in that things cannot be restored but late in that your mind is already programmed to think and talk negatively so it may take a while for you to recalibrate you know one of the major assignments of parents is to teach their children spiritual things. Children that were properly raised should have known these things from when they were growing up. As children, they should have known it. To only bless and not curse. To only speak the right words. Honorable words and pure words. This is how children were trained those days. Those days when Fathers and mothers were not yet addicted to TikTok. Because now it's nannies that raise children. And nannies, you know, nannies pick their walls from the gutters. So children are a reflection of nannies. In the days where children were properly trained, they knew these things growing up. And so most of us, unfortunately, were raised by nannies. And so we started using foul words from age two. The, the mother will be pressing phone and chatting. The child will now come and say something wrong. The mother will now say, shut up. Where did you learn that from? Where did you learn? Why, won't she, why won't you learn it? Are you not the one who dumped him to the nanny? The teacher is doing her work. Never did that again. Never did. My dear, sorry. I had my, don't worry. Don't mind these useless children. She too has just confirmed. <laughs> I 
Are you seeing why society is being wrecked? And people will come and be blaming churches. It's pastors that are destroying the world. Which pastors? The first guilty people are parents. Because the first teachers of a society is father and mother. If you are taught correctly in your family, a pastor can't deceive you. You will know truth in your spirit. Praise God. Although some pastors are not trying. Now, because we all didn't begin to learn these things as children, we need to also understand how to quickly adjust and empower our words. Because when we speak, the change that we create is reflective of our different levels of understanding this truth. And so in order to bring everybody up to speed, there are certain spiritual things, spiritual wisdom, spiritual capsules that if learned and applied can quickly improve your world so that your words can become effective. And so I give you four of them very quickly. Things that you must do in order to quickly begin to doctor your world and to repair the damage that your words are suffering either from how they were taught or from how they were spoken. The first is that everyone who wants to make the most of these realities must learn to energize their words. Some of us hear this because we were trained in fear, we were trained in doubt, and some were trained in iniquity. Even if we start saying the right words now, those words will be weak. There will be no energy in it. Because fear would have weakened the potency of the words already. So somebody may leave this service today and say, wow, what that man thought was true. From today, I will only be speaking the right thing. And that's beautiful. And the person may start speaking only the right things. But you will discover that even though you are speaking the right things, you may not command the right result just yet. Because your words don't have the energy. You are not speaking it from conviction. You are not speaking it from so many planes that should have been natural to you if you were brought up with it. And so there are spiritual antidotes that must be applied to spoken words in order for spoken words to become efficacious. And the first of such antidote is what we call energizing of your words. And the way you energize your word is by praying. And so before you speak, what you must do is to pray. If you pray before talking, you will discover that your words will carry more weight. The reason is because you are learning these principles late. Somebody else who has mastered this can just wake up from bed and speak and the impact will be rapid and ferocious. Another person may be shouting, nothing will happen. They said the same things, thing, but they said it at different energy level. And so in order to quickly doctor your words, you need to begin to learn to energize your words. And the way to energize your word is to put prayer into your words. The Bible said in Jude verse 20, it said, you dearly beloved, building up yourself upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So when you pray, what happens to you is that you ascend to a higher energy level. And you will discover when you speak, the weight will be different. The reason is because prayer has doctored that word. So that word will produce more impact than it should have produced if spoken without prayer. And so many times, Christians don't know this truth. So they want to speak words that are forceful. And they think it's by shouting that they will create impact. Volume changes nothing. It is the supply of the spirit that changes things. And the supply of the spirit comes from the place of prayer. So if you want your words to begin to make impact before you speak, add prayer. In James 5, 16, it said the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He maketh tremendous power available. That power is what is injected into your words. So a man who speaks words of power, 
he's not only speaking correct words he's speaking energized words and the way to speak energized words is to add prayer to those words so prayer is not for intercessors make no mistakes about that prayer is not for pastors prayer is for every man who wants to speak words that can create change you may be a ceo if you don't add energy to your words your 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 managers will loot the whole money in your company and you will wake up to discover that you build the company to empower thieves but when your words carry energy and you show up you tell them nobody steals here that was we being printed on their heart like a terror you will not be there they'll be afraid because of the weight the words carry you don't have to shout just energize your words you can energize your word to a point where when you speak your words become law even when you are not there people will tremble it will be as though you are present with them they will be careful in your absence they will tremble in your absence not because you threaten them but you spoke energized words and the way to energize your word is to cook it in the place of prayer many people are speaking weak words and they are speaking it oratorially and they are speaking it with loud volume and they think loud volume creates power no it doesn't loud volume simply means it's loud find out men who know this mystery they can walk up to you and say that thing you did don't do it again they may even be smiling don't do it again even if that person were to die he won't repeat it again the way that was the, the way he will hear it he will not hear it with his ear every cell in his body will hear it that thing don't do it again because words have different energy did you hear about the word of god the, the, the credential of the word of god in psalm 29 he said the word of god is full of majesty he said the word of god is upon many waters the voice of god he said the voice of god it divided the flames of fire the voice of god causes the hand to carve the voice of god discovered the forest he said the voice of god thundered that's the level of energy that the voice of god carries that's why he speak once you hear twice it's energy and you can build momentum into your words that when you speak words once people will hear twice not because you threaten them but your words have weight have you not seen people with weightless words they come they are shouting they are shouting they forget that person leave them leave them that's where they talk they are just shouting even when you are shouting they say forget them or guys shouting i will kill somebody here <laughs> leave them leave them that's where they talk they don't know what they talk ah and you are the boss it's because your words are light so they can trivialize it but a man who has energized his words he may not come to the office if you say i'm coming in two hours everybody will couple paul had this level of authority he said i am not with you in the flesh but in the spirit i've judged you when he spoke his words were laws to the churches that he wrote to ordinary letters corrected and rebuked churches whereas there are other places where men are present shouting nothing is happening do you think your children will hear you because you love them your love for them will be the reason why they will be spoiled if you want your children to hear you your words must carry energy and so when you come you say don't do this they will know even when you are not around that word will travel with them like an umbrella creating a shield over them but there are many people they've loved their children into hell love their children into 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 prison men of authority they know the value of words so they keep energizing their words you want to go for the meeting tomorrow to address the board of directors and you sleep and wake up and you go there with english language and a briefcase it will change nothing before you go there cook what you will say in three hours of tongues Paris, when you show up in the meeting you will say my dear colleagues i just want you to know that as you are talking they say yes yes we will do it we will do it because you are speaking weight you are not speaking english Let's
servants that are looking for weak ladies to misbehave with. And he just came around, students sat down. He was talking, trying to misbehave with the ladies. And his students said, Stop that! The lecturer, he staggered in fear. From that day, he became careful. If he wants to do anything, he will call the guy. What do you think? His word is not shouting. If you don't have words and you say it, you will have carry over until you have extra year. But when you have words, when you talk, their cell will vibrate. The cell will vibrate. Quivers and shock will hit them. Christians need to learn to cook their words. Your words are too light. Your word will respond to it. Please sit down. I want to teach it so that you apply it. Stop that! Those students shout on lecturers. Well, if you have heavy words, you can address certain things. Wait. See, even you will know. When you talk, you will sense virtue leave you. You will sense it. Because you generated that virtue. That word will become a conveyor. Why do you think people are failing in life? They are speaking light words. A man will labor and set up an organization. Charlatans will come and wreck it. How dare you? Oh, not when somebody who has authority is around. You will speak. If they try it, they can die. There are certain people that build their institution. If you stay here, you die. And you think it's a joke, you will steal and die. Because that was carry energy. If you violate it, so long as it's within the boundary of righteousness, you will see the impact. That's how we should live. And so you must learn to begin to doctor your words. They called you to give a presentation. Don't rush with English. Don't rush with intelligence. You will become like a peacock. And when you fail, you, you will appear naked. Come with energy. Don't talk English. Talk weight. A university in America who usually invite preachers to read Psalm 23 because the heritage of the university is Christian. So usually on their convocations, they will invite preachers on political basis to read Psalm 23 just to make it part of the ceremony. They now invited somebody with heavy words. He showed up and he opened it. Usually they will give you less than five minutes because they are being forced by tradition to do it. It's not like they want to. And when he opened it, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The moment he started reading Psalm 23, the atmosphere changed. Before he got to chapter 4, people were already on the floor. Revival had begun. The Holy Ghost started falling on people. People were weeping. People were repenting. People were coming to the altar to kneel down to confess their sins. He didn't do another call. He was just talking with weight. With weight. You can't go out for evangelism with weightless words. And then you are coming to tell a harlot that Jesus died for you. She will say, I know. I've heard it before. Many preachers have told me. But when you come with weight and you said the Lord died for you, that word will become a burden on her spirit. She will weep all night. She will look for you. She won't know why. We need men that carry walls that are heavy. We have intelligent, eloquent people talking without weight. And so the way you add weight to your words is by cooking your words in prayer. Some of the places we go to preach, the moment you stand, you just see, walk, count, count down. I went somewhere, they gave me 20 minutes. Uh -uh. I traveled all the way to come and talk for 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. What will you say? When I saw the program and I saw that my time was 20 minutes, I said, okay, I don't need to teach here. I need to bring weight. So I excused myself and went to the bathroom. I closed my eyes as if my eyeballs would break. Because I needed to quickly travel very deep. And in that bathroom, I, I didn't shout because you can't shout there. 
I pressed into my spirit the way you squeeze clothes for something to come out. When I finished squeezing my spirit and came out, my eyes were red. The moment I carried the mic, there was no preaching. Pareketeka, Baba. Instantly, the power of God began to move. I did only impartation and left. The next time they invited me, they gave me two hours. When you have worked, anything you say makes sense. Because what they are hearing is not English, it's spirit and life. Do you think sickness responds to English? It responds to weight. Somebody has a growth, it will vanish because you say go. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is the heritage of every believer. So long as you can pray, you can cook your words. And so if your walls are light, it's because you are not a good cook. Go to kitchen. The kitchen is the altar. Go there and incubate a bit. Come out and see how wise men will hear you and tremble. I went somewhere for a meeting and they asked for suggestion. So they pointed three of us. When I spoke, a professor came and said, please, that thing you said, can you write it for me? I said, I didn't talk from my head. I don't know what I said. Can you write it? I said, I don't know. That one came for that hour. When another hour comes, God will bring more words. You need wait. Circumstances will respond to English. They will respond to wait. And so if you want to master the art of spoken words, you must learn how to cook it. Cook it. The longer you cook it, the more potent it is when it is delivered. The second way to manage spoken words is to infuse it with grace grace in Colossians chapter 4 verse 6 it says let your words be seasoned with grace you need to cook your words with grace and the way you put grace into your words is to bring light, truth and wisdom is truth and wisdom. Wisdom is what defines how you say it. Truth is what defines what you say. Because if what you say is a lie, even if it was said well, there's no grace in it, so it won't edify. And if what you say is truth, but it is not said with wisdom, even though it is true, it will still not edify. There are many people who believe their, all, their, their own is to say the truth. And all the truth they say destroys people. Because they don't add wisdom to it. Somebody does something wrong. And then you come and say it in a way that he will never be able to repent. Because you castigate and destroy him. And when they ask you, you say, no, me, I speak truth. What you said is truth. But there's no wisdom in it. And because there's no wisdom in it, it will be void of grace. And so that your word can produce result. And so the way to season your word with grace is to garnish it with truth and wisdom. Truth means say what is right. Don't compromise on your standards. And wisdom is say it in a way that it will not destroy but build someone. If you are able to talk like that, your words will begin to have power. Number three. The way to energize your words is to infuse it with love. Before you speak to somebody, put yourself in the person's shoe and ask yourself, if you heard that thing, will it bless you? If it will not bless you, you are not qualified to say it. And so Ephesians 4.15, it says, speaking the truth in love. I'm showing you how to use words to change things. And trust me, if you apply these things, there's no circumstance that will defile it. A word cooked in prayer, a word spoken in truth and in wisdom, a word spoken in love, there is no way it can, it, there is no mountain that can stop it. When those words go forth, they must create change. That's how we change things. Now, when you speak in love, apart from the fact that people will open up to receive it, 
the nature of God will also be transferred through it. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says God is love. So when you are speaking in love, you are actually speaking God. And when God steps into the situation, change is inevitable. Many times, the reason people are saying the truth, but they can't bless, is because they are not spoken in love. So when men who should be blessed by those words hear them, they lock their spirit. They are not sure why you are saying what you are saying. Somebody claims he wants to advise you. Meanwhile, this advice is giving you is to ridicule you publicly. Everybody will now see him as a wise man and a good man. They will now see you as a waste and a rebellious person. That's not an advice. That is manipulation. You are using that person to gain acceptance and his wickedness. Before you speak to people, you must make sure that what you are telling them will help them and make them better. That's the spirit of love. When you operate like that, God himself will validate it. This is how words are made powerful. They are made powerful by, being, by energizing with prayer. They are made powerful by being truthful and wise. They are made powerful by being injected with grace. They are made powerful by being infused with love. And number four, your words must be infused with faith. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2, it says, unto us was the gospel preached. Unto them was the gospel preached as it was preached unto us. He said, but it did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. Every time you hear words or speak words, if all you are interested in is the communication correctness and faith is not added, the package the world came with will not be delivered to you. Most people, even when you are saying be healed, they can't receive it. They just receive it as part of the service. And because they don't mean good faith, even though that word, that word comes with power to heal, they can't receive it. And somebody else is healed, they are wondering, why are they not healed? It's because faith interaction is what makes the word potent. When the word comes forth, how you receive it is what determines what you receive from it. He said the word did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. And so many times, the problem is not with the world, it's with the receiver. Either that it was not received with faith or it was not spoken with faith. The moment faith is injected into words, words become powerful. Number five. Words potent are spoken from the place of revelation not information when you speak from revelation you will be shocked what that word will achieve for you it will literally overwhelm you when you speak from revelation many times you don't even feel anything but the words just come to you and because it came it came to you the outcome will blow your mind one of our brothers came to tell me, he said I was speaking and the Lord quickened the word. It came to me by revelation and I said, somebody will receive a land and we receive another land and it will happen in, the, in a matter of days. And this person will step into the business of real estate. And the brother said the moment the word came, he caught it. That this word was for him. And to my greatest dismay, I had forgotten. Only for him to show up two weeks later and say they gave him a large piece of land. And that while he was yet processing that one, they gave him another large piece of land. And these are lands in hectares. If you call me back to come and stand and say you will receive a land, I will refuse. Because even me, I won't believe it. But the moment it came by revelation, every hindrance to the world was already removed. That's how revelations work. In the last miracle service, I just I was walking, I just heard somebody has an enlarged scroto. It, it goes down now. And I just declared it. And I didn't feel any virtue. I didn't feel any anointing. I felt nothing. But I know I just heard it. And the moment I said it, the power did not come from me. It came from the revelation. 
And so every time a man speaks from the place of revelation, the outcome always is mind-blowing. And so a man who has words that create changes is a man who prepares his spirit to receive revelation. As revelations come to you, revelations energize your word. Many times, people have no access to revelation. That's why their words are weak. These are ways of doctoring your words. If you want your words to become potent, you must constantly, consciously, and progressively apply these realities to your words. Finally, your words must be spoken in the name of Jesus. If you want your words to be powerful, you must speak them in the name of Jesus. In Mark 16, 17, it says, In my name, your words will cast out devils. So what energized your words is because they were said in the name of Jesus. In Colossians 3, 17, the Bible says that everything should be done in the name of the Lord. If you speak in your name, you may have few results, but I assure you, many times, your walls will be barren. But if you come in the name of the Lord, you will be shocked the credibility that that name will give to your words. People speak in the name of their uncles. People speak in the name of their physical and natural positions. People speak in the name of their human connection. And the Bible says, Woe unto him that puts his trust in the arm of flesh. Some even speak in the name of doctors. The doctor knows you are dying. He is just being professional because they taught him not to lose coordination before the patient. And he tells you to be well. It's fine, it's fine. And you ask them, they say, No, they are doctors. Say, they are doctors. Who doctor is that? Ask the doctor, say, honestly, this thing you are saying, do you mean it? The doctor will lower, lower your voice and say, lower his voice and say, please, if there's any other thing you can do, do quickly. They are trying, but the problems of life are largely spiritual. And so many times they are handicapped. As beautiful as it is to receive the doctor's help, you can't walk depending on the doctor's verdict. The greatest assurance you can have in your life is for your life to be built on the name of Jesus. Sir, everything you say and do, please make sure you are convinced in yourself that you are not doing it because a man promised you. He said, woe unto him that trusted in man. Anything you are doing in this life that you bank your life on, I beg you in the name of God, make sure you do it believing in the name of Jesus. Men can take you far, but they can go thus far. Only God can take you to the end of the journey. And so everything you say and do, according to Colossians 3.17, it says, do in the name of the Lord. You'll find the man whose words are powerful. He always speaks in the name of Jesus. He believes it and he says it. There are many people the last thing they believe in the day is the name of Jesus. Sometimes they use it religiously, but they themselves know they don't believe it. Somebody will come and speak to you boldly in the name of Jesus. When you now tell him, okay, because of this thing you have said, I won't do any other thing. He said, no, 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 no. <laughs> my brother, my brother, my brother. Heaven help those who help themselves. <laughs> Please, be very careful. You know this thing needs wisdom. He doesn't believe the name of Jesus is talking about. And so if you want your words to be powerful, you must sit on the word of God until the name of Jesus becomes real to you. He said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. He said the righteous run it therein, they are saved. Many persons here, when we begin to make declarations in the name of Jesus, maybe because I didn't come today in the similitude of fire and they are not feeling something. They may not take it as they would take it when they are feeling a sensation. That means they operate on sensation, not on truth. If you know the potency of the name of Jesus, you can wake up from bed 
and use the name of Jesus to create change. It is not tied to how you feel. It is tied to how you believe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run it therein and they are saved. So six ways of empowering your words is number one, energize them through prayers. Number two, infuse grace into them by speaking truth and wisdom. Number three, infuse love into them. Number four, add faith to them. Number five, speak from the point of revelation. And number six, always speak in the name of Jesus. If you consciously begin to add this to your life, you will be shocked the result you will begin to command. Because life is designed to respond to these truths and these realities. For those who are receiving and not speaking, in interacting with spoken words, there are three things you must do. Number one, you must believe it. When words are spoken to you, for the words to be effective, you must believe it. And so you need to bring your heart to a position where you believe the words before they are spoken. Because if you don't believe it, no matter how many times you hear it, it won't create any change. And so you must bring yourself to that point where you believe it. Do everything you can to believe it because that's where the answer lies. If you don't believe it, nothing will happen. Hope you know Jesus spoke to some people and nothing happened. He said he came into his hometown and he said he could not do any mighty work there because of their unbelief. Except few folks that he laid hands on and were healed. So it was the few that believed that were blessed. The many who didn't believe, Jesus the son of God himself showed up and nothing happened. Because wars are powerful to the degree that they are believed. If you don't believe in them, it doesn't matter who is saying them. But the moment you believe in them, you will see outcomes that are superior many times, even to the person speaking. Number two, you must obey them. In John chapter 2, from verse 5, Mary told them, please, this man can turn things around. He said, but under one condition, whatever he tells you to do, do. Turning things around is not the issue. Your obedience is what we deliver. He said, trust me, this situation looks chaotic, but the chaos is not the issue. If you will do what he tells you to do, this chaotic situation can quickly be turned around. He said, whatever he tells you to do, do. And that's the law of activating the power of words. Only words you believe and obey work for you. A word you don't believe in will never work. Sometimes you say, God is lifting you. You will say, say amen, they will not. I saw when our sister came up. To take the offering. He said, God told her that today your offering is being given to service your faith so he can produce something in your life. And nobody responded. She had to tell them, Church, I say, God said. And so you get to understand the levity with which people treat words. That's why. People largely do not receive from God. People are moved by men, not by the word of God. And so the person they feel is more ranking and anointing. When he shows up, they are shouting. Whether what he's saying is of God or not. But somebody else shows up and tells you, God said. Why did the God say not get your attention? Even when she had to re-echo it. He still didn't get your attention. That means many people are not dis predisposed to receiving from, that, from God in that service. Because the word of God doesn't mean much to them. Come to places where things happen. The moment you say God said, everybody stands up. God 
is it God that said? Is it the God of heaven that said? If it's that God, I'm ready. Before you speak, they are already hungry, expectant, and full of faith. As you are uttering what God said, the way they will catch it. Even a hungry lion won't catch it as fast as them. But somebody says, God says, yeah, we've heard that many times. That's church language. And that's why you have heard many God said and your life is not improving. Because you are not believing and you are not obeying. But tonight, somebody will hear, he will believe and he will obey. And as you believe and obey, the mountains will be leveled. Finally, when you hear spoken words, as the impact begins to happen, testify. Do you know the ratio of those who testify versus those who receive? This one is to nine. Ten lepers came to Jesus. And Jesus told them, go show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, ten of them were healed. Only one came back to give thanks. Every time you hear testimony, know that it's one is to nine that came to the altar. Because men are eager to receive. But men are very ungrateful. When it comes to thanksgiving, they become tired. And they are hoping that God will keep doing how will God keep doing to an ungrateful heart? This is why many persons don't really profit from God or from the things of the spirit because God knows they are too selfish to thank him when it is done. In fact, even if God wants to, their heart posture will make it impossible for them to receive. But you are not that kind of person because as God blesses you, you will testify. As God visits you, you will testify. As God will touch you tonight, you will testify. If you are that person who will receive and who will testify, your amen will be louder. Jesus, your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that he died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. I, therefore, confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. If you just said this prayers, congratulations. You are now a member of the family of God.